Well, hey everyone, Pastor Matt here from Trinity Bible Church. Hey, thanks for tuning in here and taking the time to, to view this message. I trust that it's going to minister to you and God will use it to encourage you today. Today is Good Friday, and so this is a day that is both uh, very difficult and also infinitely beautiful. And so we want to take a few moments this morning to get into God's Word and to consider the importance of what this day means and, and really its implications, not only today, but ultimately forevermore. Um, just before we do that, I do want to remind you that, that we have also uh, provided some other links to visit as, as part of what we're offering here at Trinity for you today, um, a, a music, a worship playlist for you to, to uh, have and to listen to. And I also want to remind you and, and really extend an invitation to you to join us uh, for Resurrection Sunday this coming Sunday as we celebrate together. Uh, we are going to be holding a live call on Zoom at 10 a.m. and the link has, has been provided on our church website. So um, if you're able at all to make it happen, uh, we'd love to, to see you there. Um, if you're not able to make that time or the technology won't cooperate for you, uh, we do want you to know that we are still going to provide a message for you through our, our normal format uh, on YouTube. We'll also have a worship playlist and our regular uh, youth and children's curriculum as well. So we'd love to see you there live, but if you can't make it, we still hope that you would join us in, in celebrating the resurrection. It's Good Friday, uh, and there are a lot of different angles that you can approach Good Friday from. You can look at it through the various uh, eyewitness accounts, the stories told by those who were there, uh, the witnesses who, who share in the Gospels of, of what happened to Jesus of Nazareth as he was put to death, and even the hours leading up to his death. Um, you can see things from the vantage point of the various characters, uh, the criminals who were executed alongside him, uh, the soldiers who mocked him and, and crucified him, uh, the religious leaders who sought to end his public ministry, the ones who saw him as, as a threat and a teacher of blasphemy, um, the, the public official of the time, the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. Inevitably, though, in all these different vantage points, the story works its way toward the cross, that, to that place where sorrow and love meet, where God's mercy and God's justice collide together. And today we will also end up at the cross, but we're going to go back even further in history before we get there. We're going to be reading from a passage of scripture that was written some 700 years before Jesus walked the earth. And we're going to see a prophecy given that, that really only Jesus could completely and beautifully fulfill. So please turn with me now in your Bibles or, or tap on your Bible app to uh, the book of Isaiah. We're going to be on Isaiah chapter 53 this morning. That's our, our main text for this message. And, and we're going to work our way through the whole chapter, but, but more in sort of a, a summative flyover type of way. Uh, not so much an, an exegetical verse by verse, point by point uh, type of way. And what we'll do is just really draw out the main themes found within and, and seek to unpack them here. This is a familiar passage, and it is one of the most quoted texts, the, one of the most quoted set of verses from the Old Testament that speaks to the gospel and good news of Jesus. But within its context, it's, it's highly controversial. This is part of a number of passages that we find in the book of Isaiah that speak to this coming Messiah. This is uh, part of, of, of these things. Now, that in itself is not controversial. If you read in Isaiah, you, you see in different chapters, in chapter 42 and chapter 49, chapter 50, and chapter 52, right before, uh, you see these passages referring to this great servant of the Lord. But then in chapter 53, things take a very drastic and sudden turn because as you read through this chapter, in 53, you see at, at least at first that this great servant of the Lord is going to suffer and, and that the servant is going to die. And that flies in the face of everything that's been written about this person up until that point. Because in the other passages, we see that he will be great. We see that he will be obedient to the Lord. We see that he will bring salvation. But then he's being described here in chapter 53 as being wounded and being crushed. So this is startling to say the least and, and really shocking and, and, and ultimately sobering. And so this is where we pick things up. We're going to start in verse 1. Uh, we'll look first at verses 1 to 3. It says, who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. 
He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. So the first thing we need to know right off the bat here is that Jesus is familiar with our rejection and our grief. Jesus is familiar with our rejection and our grief. Have you ever had to deal with disappointment? Have you ever had someone let you down? Have you ever felt the pain of, of losing a loved one? Have you gone through life feeling overlooked at times or, or misled or misunderstood? That, that no one notices you, no one cares about you, no one is willing to listen to you? This is the reality of living in a fallen and a broken world. Uh, this is where our understanding of God, of, of the world he created, uh, of, of even our understanding of ourselves, it has been distorted. And that's happened because we've exchanged the, the, the pure truth that God originally designed for us to live in and to walk in and to breathe in. We've exchanged that for a contaminated distortion. And so as a result, our value system is, is on its own, not compatible with God's good design, but it is instead left to the pull and push and, and the sway of popular opinion. What we do is we, we establish our worth and our identity through what the culture around us tells us is most important and what is best. And so as these values are exchanged in the, in the rhythms of life, the ebbs and flows of life, what happens is we cause pain and we feel pain. We inflict pain upon one another intentionally at times, other times unintentionally, unknowingly even. But pain is born out of this flawed value system that thinks and acts outside the truth of a good and pure and holy God. That is a consequence of our broken world. Now, amazingly, these verses tell us a little bit about how Jesus entered into that realm, how Jesus came into our broken world and that he himself experienced rejection. Now, think for a moment about the time and the setting of his life. He, he came into a part of the world that had seen its peak hundreds of years before. Even at the time of this writing in Isaiah, uh, the nation of Israel had already been on its, on its decline, so to speak. Um, it had been conquered many times over by various kingdoms and empires that had risen and fallen over the course of history. And so at the time of, of Jesus' life, um, Judea was really this, this tiny province as part of the vast Roman Empire. And if you and I, if, if we were to write the story, we would really want, we would likely want this great servant of the Lord to be born in Rome, probably, because that was the cradle of power of the known world at the time. Or, or maybe if not Rome, we would at least want Jesus to be born in the city of Jerusalem, because that was the, the historical and cultural capital. Uh, it had religious significance. It was the site of the temple of God. So that would be how we'd write it. But Jesus was born into fairly relative obscurity. We, we know hardly anything about his childhood or his adolescence. And it really isn't until he's about 30 years of age as he begins his, his public ministry that we see this volume of accounts. And even then, there isn't necessarily something about him that would cause us in our own distorted value system to be drawn to him. Uh, he wasn't a rock star. He wasn't a bodybuilder. He wasn't an entrepreneur. And though he had this amazing ministry over the final three years of his earthly life, even then we know that Jesus was rejected. It's recorded in Luke's gospel that the people of his very hometown, the town of Nazareth, they rejected him. They sought to drive him away. Some even wanted to kill him. We know that, that even the most devout Jews, the, the religious leaders at the time, the ones who, who knew the law and the scriptures better than anyone else, the ones you would think who would be most excited to see him and welcome him and, and learn from him, they were blinded by their religiosity and thought of him only as a blasphemous troublemaker. So he was rejected. And verse 3 tells us that he was acquainted with grief. Now the word acquainted doesn't have as much impact on us when we just read it as it is because in the English language, an acquaintance is someone that you, you barely know. You've, you've maybe just met them in passing, but you don't, well them, you don't know them well enough to consider them your friend. You might add them on social media, but there's not really that level of familiarity. Jesus knew grief. He was familiar with all grief. He experienced grief to the fullest. He experienced the pain and the loss that we inflict upon one another and that we inflict upon ourselves. He is familiar with our rejection and grief. 
And the next number of verses here draw out really the, the main points of what Isaiah is envisioning here as he sees this servant and as he writes about this servant. Read verses four to six with me. It says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, and yet he opened not his mouth. We'll stop it there. Jesus has carried the consequences for our sin. He has carried the consequences of our sin. Now this is, this, again, this is unimaginable that this great servant of the Lord, the one who is to deliver the people of God, the one who is to restore his kingdom, that he's going to take upon himself the burden of, of pain and brokenness, that, that distortion of values, all the consequences that come from it. Look at the wording here. It says he's borne our griefs. He has carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. He was pierced. Again, this is unfathomable. That, that one who is holy and righteous and all that is good, that he will undeservedly take upon himself all these things, these wrong and foul and evil things. He's taking on my shame and your shame, our violent acts and our nasty thoughts, the, the venomous words we say, the lying and the cheating and the stealing, and the backstabbing, the mudslinging, the manipulating. Jesus has taken it all upon himself. He has done this for our for us. These verses make it clear that they are our griefs, they are our sorrows, they are our transgressions, they are our iniquities. And this is a collective hour because verse 6 tells us so. It says that we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Every single one. We've all turned to our own ways, to our own value system, to our own distorted pursuits. In the New Testament, we're told in, in Romans chapter 3 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This is our condition apart from God, where, where we inherently have this within each and every single one of us. We are prone to wander. Nobody likes to think of themselves as broken. And we don't want us to, to be thought of as that we need to be fixed. Uh, our pride rarely permits such an admission. We try to convince ourselves that, that if we just kind of try to, to, to get cleaner, if we just act smarter, if we just work harder, then over time what that will mean is that, that we live better. And that may be true in the short term, that may work in one sense, but it does nothing whatsoever to ever truly negate the consequences of our sins. So, so we don't like to think of ourselves as broken, and even beyond that, we certainly don't like to be called sinful. Sure, I'm not perfect, but, but sinful? You're calling me a, a sinner? But once you come to terms with the reality of your sin, that is a game changer. That is a game changer because then the pace qu quickens. Then there's, there's an urgency. There's a, a frantic need, a rush to try and find a solution, to come up with some sort of cure, some sort of antidote, something that will bridge the gap that exists between sinful man and a holy God. And this is where the Christian faith is, is truly so drastically different than other religions. Because in other religions, the messaging is just, well, do more. <laughs> Be a good person. Do good deeds. Hopefully in the end, the good will outweigh the bad. You'll, you'll have good karma. You will reach that, that place where, where you can know that hopefully you make it in. You make it to paradise. And there waiting for you are the pinnacle of human delights. And the Bible tells us very clearly that on our own, we can't make it. Even if we know we have a problem, we can't fix it ourselves. We need to be saved. We need to be rescued. We need to come home. We were created for a relationship with a good and loving God. And so we have this internal longing to one day have that relationship, to be restored in his presence. See, our, our paradise is, is being in the presence of God himself. Our paradise is God. So we have that longing. He is all that is good. He is far beyond any earthly pursuit. So we long to get back to him. We can't find the way back by ourselves. 
And thankfully, we're told that the, at the end of verse 5 here that, that healing is possible, that there is a glimmer of hope. And we're going to come back to that in a bit. But it says, by his stripes, by his wounds, the wounds inflicted upon the suffering servant, that we can find the healing that we so desperately need. So hope lingers in the midst of the sorrow described here. Let's continue on with verses 7 to 9. This is really a continuation of the main points here. Reading again. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Jesus has died in our place. He has died in our place. Now, again, this is shocking because we're told that this amazing servant of the Lord is not only going to suffer, but here in these verses, we're told he is actually going to die. And this would have been shocking for someone reading about this at Isaiah's time, just as shocking as it was to watch Jesus being brought out before the crowds, standing beside Pilate with the angry mob, shouting the words, crucify him. John's gospel records the scene and, and, and the exchange between the two men as they stand side by side before the people. One standing who has all heavenly power from all eternity at his disposal and one who is propped up with temporary earthly authority. And Pilate shows some frustration towards Jesus. He at least gives a little bit of an impression that maybe he's trying to, to help Jesus avoid what is coming. And so he asks the questions, why won't you speak to me? Why won't you answer? Don't you know that I'm the one who has the authority to, to release you? I'm the one who has the authority to, to order for them to crucify you? And of course, this is such an ironic question because Pilate has no idea whatsoever who he truly is speaking to. But Jesus, like that sheep before its shearers, remains silent. So Pilate turns to the crowd again and he asks the question, what has he done wrong? Shall I crucify your king? The response, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And we won't get into all the explicit details of, of what crucifixion entails, but, but in summary, this is a, a morbid practice of extreme physical torture. To, to be nailed to a tree, we see the cross behind me here, to be nailed to this piece of wood with your body weight pulling you down so that over time you are suffocating while simultaneously losing blood. This is not pleasant. The lamb was led to the slaughter. He was whipped. He was beaten. He was mocked. He was stripped down, spat upon. He was given a crown of sharp thorns to be dug into his scalp. And he was left hanging on the tree to die. A physical death, because we're told in Scripture, because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sin, but, but also a spiritual separation from the Father. This break in the perfect unity that existed and enjoyed by the Trinity from all time, from before the beginning of time. Those agonizing moments when Jesus cried out from the cross, those words quoting the 22nd Psalm, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Father pouring out his wrath on the sin of the world, turning his face away in those moments from his beloved son. Jesus died a physical death and a spiritual death on the cross. He was cut out. He was cut off out of the land of the living, we're told in verse 8. He was buried in a grave. And there's a reference here in this verse to, to a rich man. And of course, that prophecy comes true in the Gospels when we read about Joseph of Arimathea, the one who volunteers to take down the body of Jesus and lay it in a garden tomb. This is a central truth of what we believe. This is Jesus presenting himself as that ultimate offering, as the true and full atonement, the one who gives himself as a substitute in our place, as the payment for our sin. Uh, really, the, the proper terminology used here is penal substitution. He has been our substitute. He has died in our place. And we read in Romans chapter 5 that, that while we were still weak, that he has died for the ungodly. 
Paul the Apostle, as he writes, he says that it's, it's, it rarely happens that someone would die for a righteous person. Maybe for a good person, someone might be willing to lay down their life to give it up. But this is how we know that God loves us. This is how God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, still broken, distorted, living according to the ways of the world, Christ died for us. This death is not something done in a general sense. This is, this is Jesus dying the death that we all individually deserve because of our sin. This is Jesus dying in my place. This is Jesus dying in your place. And so when you come face to face with the reality of your brokenness, when you see that you need to be rescued, when you realize just how terrible your sin is, then you understand just how amazing this sacrifice is. And amazing as this all is, one question remains. Does it work? <laughs> is the sacrifice sufficient? Is it even all worth it for the servant to go through this? Let's finish our time here by looking at the last few verses of the chapter. Verses 10 to 12. It says, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. So Jesus is familiar with our rejection and our grief. Jesus has carried the consequences of our sin. Jesus has died in our place and Jesus has faithfully won our freedom. He has faithfully won our freedom. How do we know that the transfer went through? Well, these verses tell us that, that in those moments when on the cross, Jesus cried out those words, it is finished. When he cried those words out, it really was. Our freedom has been secured. Our sin and guilt can now be forgiven. Verse 10 says that the servant shall see his offspring, that, that his day shall be prolonged. In verse 11, it says that by his knowledge, many will be accounted righteous. That's why we talk about coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus, because we're marked righteous when we know and believe what he has done. This is a righteousness that's not based on work. It's not based on self-earned merit, but it is only by the grace of God because he has accepted the offering of the servant. Those wayward sheep who've gone astray, they can now come home. They can be counted among the family of God by believing in the name of Jesus. This is what makes Friday good. The servant was faithful to go to the cross for you and I and for the glory of God Almighty. He has poured himself out, verse 12 says. And, and Jesus used very similar terminology the night before all these events took place when he shared that meal with his closest friends. He took bread and then he took the cup after dinner and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. The new covenant is his precious blood being poured out. And so we certainly lament and regret today that we can't share a time of communion together as we normally would. But I do encourage you that, that if there are other believers in your household or, or who you're watching this with, I would encourage you to take some time here after this video, even to, to, to find some bread and some juice or, or wine even, and to take a few moments of, of solemn self-reflection as scripture instructs us to do, and to then thank Jesus for what he has done for you, for dying on the cross and taking the punishment that you and I deserve. This is one of those things that really marks our physical gathering as a church body. And so we certainly do look forward to that day, someday soon, hopefully, where we can again share in the Lord's Supper together. But Jesus was faithful to go through with it all. He has won our freedom. He has given us our healing. By his wounds, we are healed. The Apostle Peter, who was one of Jesus' closest friends, he would later write very similar words evoking this passage in Isaiah. And, and, and Peter, someone who at his best was kind of that right-hand man for Jesus, the one who, who was willing to follow him anywhere, not without his share of mistakes and blunders, but a heart to serve Christ. But also at his worst, one who betrayed Jesus, one who denied him, one who fled the scene, one who just watched helplessly as Jesus hung on the cross and died. 
Peter would later be restored and he would be healed and he would go on to be one of the greatest preachers and ministers of the gospel. And so he knew firsthand as he wrote those words, the healing and the freedom that is found in Jesus and what his wounds mean. You and I can find that healing too. If you're watching this today and, and, and maybe you're someone who's gone to church in the past, but it's, it's been a while for you, or, or maybe you've tried to do the religion thing before, but, but just find it hard to connect with God. He seems distant, far away. Uh, maybe you're someone who you'd classify yourself as, as skeptical. You acknowledge that historically there was a guy named Jesus who walked the earth a couple, years ago, or a couple thousand years ago, and he was put to death at the hands of the Romans. You see that as a historical fact, but, but maybe nothing more. Wherever you may be at today, if you're watching this and you've never considered the claims of Jesus Christ, the, the implications of his death on the cross, I hope that this time here, this video has helped lay it out a little bit more for you. Because these words that we read from, they were written hundreds of years, even before crucifixion became a popular mode of execution. The details that are provided here in this text in Isaiah are, are fairly hard to arrange or control by someone who is being put to death. So I, it is my hope and prayer that this would give further validity to you as you consider the claims of Jesus. And beyond that, I do want you to know that Jesus did this for you, that God loves you so much that he stopped at nothing to bring you home. He wants you to know and to experience his great love. And so he wants to rescue you from the broken world, the broken life that we all live because of his love, Jesus went to the cross for you. He took the punishment for your sin. He died in your place. And although we mourn and we grieve the events of Good Friday, the consequences of our sin, we still hold on to hope because although this is a dark day on this Good Friday, we believe that Sunday is coming and with it comes the hope of the resurrection. So I want you to know that, that I am praying for you as you consider these things. And if you are someone who has put their trust in Jesus Christ, uh, if you are in Christ right now, you're seeking to live your life for him each and every single day, my prayer is also that this time has helped valid validate the, the Good Friday message, that this scene we've looked at in Isaiah would strengthen your faith, that your confidence would be boosted, really, as you know and as you see that God has set this wonderful rescue plan in motion for you, even long before it happened. We are worse sinners than we could ever know, but we have a greater Savior in Jesus. He is a greater Savior than anything we could ever imagine. It is Friday now, but Sunday is coming. And so God bless you as you've taken time today to, to reflect on these truths from his word. I'd like to pray for you just before we log off here. Father, we thank you that in your great love for us, you did not leave us to ourselves to live in a broken a uh, world full of, of consequences of sin and pain and distortion, but you put a rescue plan in motion. And so we read about it uh, even hundreds of years before it happened. We're thankful that, that your servant was willing to do this for us. Jesus, we say thank you. Thank you that you are acquainted, you are familiar with sorrow and grief. What we experience in this life is not foreign to you because you know what it means to feel pain. Jesus, thank you that you carried the consequences of our sin physically and spiritually. Thank you that you went to the cross and that you died in our place as our substitute. You were the only one who could and you were faithful and willing to do it. You laid down your life to the glory of the Father so that we could be brought home and won to you. We say thank you, Lord. And though this is a dark day in human history, we do cling to the hope of the resurrection. And so with great anticipation, we look ahead to Sunday and all the hope and significance and joy that it brings. Jesus, we say thank you that you were faithful to win our freedom. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Just a, again, really quickly, a reminder to, to, have, to join us on uh, Easter Sunday as we celebrate the resurrection. If you're able to make the live call on Zoom, we'd love to have you. And if not, we will still have resources provided for you. Take care and God bless you.